This episode of The Meat House is brought to you by Amoretti, the ultimate manufacturer of brewers' natural infusions, craft purees, and concentrates to bring your next batch to the next level. Click on the link in the episode description below to see their full lineup of flavors. Use promo code MEATHOUSE at checkout to save 15% off your next order. I, uh, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to forego with all the formalities I usually do at the beginning of the show. We're going to wait a little bit on that. We were having an interesting discussion, uh, actually kind of a fun discussion, uh, pre-show here. Uh, and I, I kind of wanted to continue down this line a little bit. And it kind of, I guess guys, it kind of ties into, you know, where we left off last week. And, you know, shame on me. I, I usually push the record button in our post-show uh, uh, discussion that we have because even at that point, you know, we have some pretty interesting uh, discussions on, on various things. But uh, we were just uh, commenting. Um, Chris had just made the statement. That he's he's uh, going to go an all-grain beer. Bro. And uh, I reminded him that now this is a guy who who doesn't drink much beer. And we've been told that before, right, guys, uh, from Chris? Yeah. 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 And so uh, and so now he's uh, he's just informed us that uh, he's going to give an all-grain go a try for a five-gallon batch. And I said, yeah, it's not going to be long. You're going to be like me. You're going to have 15 or 20 cases of beer laying around the house. So um, what prompted you to go with the all-grain, Chris? Uh, just curiosity. I just want to see if I can do it because, uh, you know, it, when I first read about it, it seemed like it was something that was so complicated. And and then when I really dug into it deeper, I found out that it's not. I mean, it's really only as complicated as you make it. Um, mostly, how much you're limited in equipment. So, yeah. Um, I, I thought, yeah, why not? I'll give it a try and. Uh, something that Jeff had said a few weeks ago, I, I had mentioned that I thought an Oktoberfest would make a good braggot. And uh, Jeff mentioned that he and his wife, or maybe it was his wife that really enjoyed box, which are, you know, they're also a lager. Uh, but when I started reading about the box after he mentioned that, I really got interested in the decoction uh, mm -hmm. mashing and, and how. Uh, there's just something about uh, the idea of the caramelized sugars and some residual sweetness and a good rich, you know, because, you know, I like things with a lot of body and, right. and some sweetness and things like that. So uh, <clears throat> I've got all the equipment to do that, uh, propane burners and turkey fryers and fish cookers and Wow, you're everything. all set up. Uh, Oh, yeah. uh, you know, well, yeah, it was just equipment that I already had. So really the only thing I've got to do is make a mash ton and do that out of a Coleman cooler. And so I'm just going to give it a try. You know, I may fall flat on my face. Who knows? But I've, I've just out of curiosity, I've just got to give it a try and see what happens. Well, that's, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, uh, I also said that, you know, I'm, I'm drinking, my wife's coffee chocolate thing, uh, stout porter, I don't know, whatever the hell it is. I think it's a, I think it's listed. It's that piece, I think it's a stout. It's listed as Peace Coffee Stout, I believe, at, at Northern Brewer. And, uh, you know, thanks to them, uh, you know, I made the remark this was one of the freebies they, they threw in when I had ordered those two uh, bourbon barrel uh, deals from my Braggot. So, I went ahead and cooked it up, and uh, I'll be damned if it didn't come out tasting really good. And my wife just absolutely loves it. I mean, she loves the chocolate, the coffee combination. She loves dark beers. She's really into the stouts and porters. So I'm actually quite proud of myself. This is the second only beer that I've brewed. Uh, the first one, of course, was that pumpkin, uh, that pumpkin thing uh, that I did, and uh, – I thought that came out very well too. So, you know, and I, I get, you know, I was a little fearful. I mean, beer is what I really wanted to do in the beginning until I found out about this mead. 
And I really, I mean, I didn't know much about brewing beer. It looked like it was complicated as hell. I spent some time on YouTube and, you know, Chris, I mean, you're talking mash tons and burners and all this stuff. And I'm thinking, holy crap, you know. Uh, and then you see these guys with garages full of, of stainless steel, you know, these great pieces of artwork, Jeff, that looks like, you know, I mean, it looks like, you know, they invested you know, their, their retirement, uh, into these, into these brewing systems, you know, and it's really not that complicated, is it? Well, no, I mean, I didn't go all out when I started making mead and, and I, I eventually got to the point where I'm making really good mead with minimal equipment because I just don't want to, uh, load up my, my house or garage or shop or anything else with tons of brewing equipment that can be done so simply. Uh, and, and sometimes when you do things more with, with less equipment in a more simple way, uh, it may require a little more effort on your part, but you know, if you're going to dedicate a half a day or a day to brewing, then what's, what's an extra hour or two's work, you know? Um, yeah, because you're you're pretty much spending the whole day doing it anyway. So uh, I'm not saying that equipment wouldn't make it easier and faster, but hey, that's part of the fun of it. Is so uh, I'm just going to yeah. keep it simple and uh, see what happens. Sure. Well, I think a lot of the the joy of brewing is just enjoying the process too. You know, you get to you you focus on something you enjoy, and you get to spend some time doing it. Um, on, on the topic of keeping things simple, um, I, I don't know if you've looked into it, but the, the whole brew in the bag approach is getting a lot of, uh, uh, interest for me just because, um, it, you know, it, it basically eliminates the need for a mash tun entirely. Um, it's, you can, you can take a decoction approach kind of after a fashion. Um, it, it's not a true decoction by any stretch of the imagination, but using just the, uh, Basically, the the kettle from your turkey fryer and a a uh, a bag like like an oversized paint strainer bag, um, you can reheat and allow for the uh, um, the different stages of decoction and um, heating that that mash water rather than adding more um, in each stage. Um, mm-hmm. So you you get a pretty close approximation that way, actually. So, and it is equipment light to be sure. Mm-hmm. Well, if you take two uh, two propane burners like you would use in a turkey fryer or a fish cooker, and one propane tank and a couple of pots and a Coleman cooler, I mean, really, you could live in an apartment. You could live in a small apartment and stash that in a closet. Uh, you know, it really doesn't take up that much room. I, I actually know someone who did just that for <laughs> probably about a year and a half. Yeah. Take it out in the back and set it up and spend a few hours brewing and then clean it all up and stash it back in a closet. And, uh, or heck you could even stash it over in the corner behind a chair or something. Well, one of the things that I've been looking at and, uh, toying around with the, uh, the idea of going all grain is, and there's actually a several systems out there, but one in particular that uh, that I've done the most research on is called the Grain Father, and it, it's a one pot. Uh, you know, it, you don't need the mash tons. It, it gets rid of all of that. It uh, does everything, and it just it's one system, small, compact, uh, electric. Uh, you know, digital controls. Uh, you know, so it, it it eliminates the need for all the extraneous, you know, mash tons and coolers and all this other stuff. Uh, so I've been I've been kind of looking at that. Um, but you I'm know, I was going to buy all four of you guys a grain father for Christmas, <laughs> but then I started I started thinking about it, and I thought, you know, y'all would feel obliged if I did that, like you owed me something. So I decided not to do it. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I know y'all are happy that I didn't, because you would have yeah. felt obligated. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> how how thoughtful. <laughs> yeah. 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 Hey, uh, so my well, gift to you is not getting you a grandfather for Christmas. They, yeah. <laughs> my wife appreciates see how I turn, that. <laughs> see, see how I turn that around? Hey, welcome to the Mead House. Uh, we just got started, guys, and we were pretty uh, pretty neck deep in this discussion before we uh, pushed the button and turned the mics on. Uh, so I thought we would uh, kind of round that off a little bit as we got started here tonight. But, uh, again, welcome to the Mead House. Uh, I know somebody around here has got the calendar. I think we've got three or four more shows to go. We're going to go on Christmas break, I think, for, I think it's two weeks, Christmas, New Year, something like that. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit later on but uh, and remind everybody where we're at uh, through the holidays. But, um you know, if you're just tuning in uh, for the first time, welcome to the show. Uh, if you're listening to us on the podcast, uh, we're glad you are. Uh, you can get the podcast at different places. Uh, you can get it from iTunes, Stitcher, Podcastpedia. You can also get it uh, at the number one place, themeadhouse.com. Uh, we've got them all piled up. Uh, if you look on the uh, left side of the uh of the website and that little column there, uh, the latest one is always up on top of that uh, that pile underneath. So uh, we're glad you're here. We've got a Facebook. Uh, it's called the Mead House. Just simply type in the Mead House uh, in your Facebook search thing, and it'll take you right to it. And that's really picking up, uh, getting quite a few likes and people passing through. And again, our website, uh, the Mead House. That's where we live. So. Uh, if you want to call the show, 818-921-4680. Love to hear from you at any time. Ryan Richardson in the house. Aaron Martin along for the ride. Mississippi Chris Spencer. He's the one that was going to get us all one of those grandfathers. Uh, Jeff Chouse is in the house. And, and Jeff, uh, the Facebook guild, have we uh, have we got anybody uh, we can uh, talk about? Sure, I've got some. Yeah, I've got a couple shout outs for us. Uh, you know, first off, there's uh, Scott Monroe, one of our, our long term listeners. I think he's been here since the beginning. Oh, yeah. Uh, mentioned, he mentioned the other day that he's doing our blueberry sizer. Um, it looks like it's going pretty well so far. So, Scott, let us know how that turns out. We're, we're anxious to hear uh, what you come up with with it. Uh, also saw a post from was, uh, Jay Renee on mead. I had a few different meads that she bottled up. Uh, and uh, one of them was a cherry pie. One of them she called the her O. Henry mead. It was figs, peaches, and uh, rose. And then a third one she had was uh, what she called the woodsman, which was with maple syrup and hickory syrup using, and I'm going to butcher this pronunciation, but probably Yapon holly honey. And it was sweetened with molasses. Some really interesting flavor combinations going on there, I thought. So I thought I'd give her a shout out and say, uh, you know, Appreciate the interesting work you're doing. Yeah. And then uh, I had a, a quick question from uh, from Rocky Hall on the Mead Maker site too. Uh, was wondering about using acorns as a tannin source. What do you guys think? Um, <clears throat> gosh, I don't see why not. You get, get kind of a nutty, nutty. Uh, might add kind of a nutty component to it, maybe. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, where did uh, what's what's he using it in? Um, it sounds like he's going to try to use it the same way you would use oak as a, a an aging and a tannin source. Um, oh, okay. With a, just a, a standard mead, I know there there was a lot of discussion on the page, and some people had you know tried this in various uh, you know meads, beers, things like that, and um, there there was a a general consensus that yeah, you kind of have to you have to let them. Uh, um, soak in some water to get some of that um, that woody flavor out, um, but it, it's possible to use. I just didn't know if you guys. I don't have know. Any... I've I've, hmm, I've bit into an acorn before just to see what it was like, and and they're pretty bitter. They're really, yeah. Um, ooh, they're 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 very tannic also. So I don't know. Uh, mm-hmm. I heard something similar from someone who was going to use uh, a walnut hole. Um, the green part and uh, yep. they were doing it not only for the tannin, but also for color. And uh, I think that turned out to be a disaster when they reported back on it. So I don't know how the acorns would go. Uh, I, um, 
I, maybe yeah, maybe taking those acorns and and roasting them, uh, you know, hauling. I mean, I hope he's hauling them out and taking you know taking an actual acorn out of the pod, right? Uh, yeah, and uh, you know maybe toasting them off somehow, or you know let them sit out and dry, and then and then toast them off somehow. Uh, you know that might help. That could be interesting. Well, on the subject yeah. of of using nuts. Um, uh, so I know this is a, a an entirely different use for them, but uh, Jeff, I think it was you that said that you had tasted the lazy magnolia uh, pecan. Yeah. Brown ale. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I found out that they get that pecan flavor in by using the pecans actually in the mash. Um, you have oh. to toast them, and. Uh, you know, put them in a plastic, I mean, excuse me, put them in a uh, paper bag or between some paper towels or something to get uh, some of the oil off. And then you crush them up and you actually use them in the mash. Um, but what you have to do is you have to add in some extra torrified wheat or carafoam or something to to make up for the loss of the head that you're going to get because of the oils. Um so if you're talking about brewing a beer, I know people use nuts in the mash. I don't know how you would go about uh, if it's a mead um, with uh, with the acorns. I, I don't know. But, hey, if it's a five-gallon batch, you know, pull off a couple of gallons and, and use the acorns on it. And save the other three gallons in case you screw it up so you still got some left. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The experimental approach always works, right? You know, I'd be interested in, uh, maybe we can contact, uh, what was the guy's name again? It was, uh, Rocky Hall. Let's, uh, let's see if we can contact him and, uh, see if we can't get him to come on the show. If he gives it a try, um, I'd like to follow that and, uh, just see what kind of luck he has with it. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe we're, uh, you know, this could be an experiment in the making here. Like Chris is talking, you know, just a short batch, uh, you know, one gallon, two gallon deal that uh, that he can play around with, and uh, let us know, you know, what the results are. So uh, let's see if we can contact him, Jeff. And, uh, I will say on a on a side note, uh, if you are looking for some an easy way to get some tannins in a five gallon batch, four black tea bags steeped in some water is a great way to do it. Get a couple of cups of water and steep uh, steep four tea, four black tea bags for about uh, ten or fifteen minutes, and add that in, and it's a it's a good way to get not, some mild tannins. Not the flavored one. No, just plain black tea, like Irish breakfast tea or something. Yeah, Tawnings yeah. Irish breakfast tea. I think that's the one, Chris, that uh, you had me pick the up. Twinning. Twinings 20, or twenty, 20 yeah, or, something like that. Yeah, yeah, I think Bigelow Bigelow also makes a good one. Uh, doesn't have to be anything fancy, just a plain black tea. Yeah. Well, uh, good deal, uh, and uh, thanks, Jeff, for the Facebook update. And we'll do this every week. Uh, I know folks out there they like to hear their names mentioned on the show, and uh, uh, sometimes uh, once in a while I will get an email from one of them and. Uh, it's a great con- get, get, great way to uh, stay up with contact. Um, what are we drinking tonight, guys? Uh, let's start off with Aaron. Uh, what's in your glass tonight? Yeah, so tonight I am cracking open a bottle of Blueberry Melomel from a meadery I discovered down in Chicago. The uh, My in-laws live, live down there in Naperville, Illinois. This is from Wild Blossom Meadery and Winery. And it's called Blueberry Nectar, 11% alcohol by volume. Um, definitely a little on the sweeter side. So you're going to be toast by the end of the show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good stuff. It's it's definitely on the sweeter side. Um, really, really pronounced honey aroma and, and flavor. Uh, I'm a fan of this. This is good. Uh, it's a little dangerous, though. You're right, J.D. If I got to got to. <laughs> Moderate myself here on a work night. <laughs> there you go. Jeff has always got something is- interesting in his cup. Jeff, uh, what is it tonight? 
Well, believe it or not, guys, tonight I am drinking some of that coffee mead. Um, oh, really? Oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, this this is one of those that I had to kind of distance myself from because at first, you know, you guys know that I was really, I, I, I wasn't impressed with how the experiment turned out. It yeah. wasn't exactly, it wasn't the coffee mead that I saw in my head that I wanted to see in my head. But I had uh, I had my buddy Chris over um, it, and uh, was going through some of the the stuff I had in progress. Uh, we cracked open a bottle of this this coffee mead. You know, I have to admit, once I got past the fact that it wasn't what I was looking for, for its own merits, it's it's actually a pretty decent brew. Um, it it is a little bit on the sweeter side than what I wanted. It does not have the that dark coffee bitter flavor. Uh, but the way that the coffee plays with the, the meat is actually, it's kind of interesting. And it's, it is, uh, it's really reminiscent of the, the one we got from Sergio in that. Um, but, you know, I, I, I don't hate it. <laughs> now yeah. that I've, I've, uh, had some time to go, oh, okay, well, it didn't turn out how I wanted it, but that's fine. I, I actually, I can enjoy this. Wow. Interesting. Sounds good. I, uh, I've got, I've had, I haven't tossed, uh, and you know, I know you guys read my email. I haven't tossed everything out. I still have a couple of gallons of coffee that I'm, I'm, I thought, you know what, let's just put this on the back burner. And, uh, uh, in fact, it's not only on the back burner, it's like on the bottom shelf in a cabinet tucked away, way in the back. So, and I just found them today. And I thought, oh yeah, what is this stuff? Uh, so. I, I'm still hoping. Uh, I'm still hoping that you know maybe some time might uh, might cure them. But uh, Chris, uh, you know, I, the last couple of shows, uh, it's been something other than coffee. What is it tonight? I've got a uh, truck stop honey brown ale. Um, this is from Back Forty Beer Company over in Gadsden, Alabama. It's a um, it's a Medium bodied English brown ale uh, using Alabama wildflower honey and a subtle hop profile. Um, and it's it's really malty. It's got a, a lot of caramel in the nose. I don't really get much of a of a nut aroma or nut flavor. Uh, really there's uh if you've had the lazy magnolia that I was talking about earlier, the pecan brown ale, uh this is almost exactly the same thing without the pecans. Um it's a it's a pretty good example of a brown ale. Um it it's one of those kind of it's uh it's like a craft beer that you can drink a lot of or, or it's the kind of craft beer that you would want to use to introduce um beer drinkers into craft beer, people who are not used to things other than than the big macro breweries. It's, yeah, it's pretty yeah. good drinking beer. Sounds good. Yeah, it does. Good deal. Uh, Ryan, I hear it sounds like he's banging around in his refrigerator uh, looking for something to drink. Ryan, did you find something? That wasn't me, whatever oh. that noise was. <laughs> I heard that a bunch of bottles. I was, I was reading the I was reading the bottle and I clanked it on my glass. Oh, <laughs> Ryan, what's in your glass tonight, bud? I, I am drinking a uh, Worker by Oregon Mead and Cider Company. It's a raspberry sparkling mead, uh, courtesy of good buddy Nate Parr out in Portland. Uh, this one is described as a lovely balance of fruit flavor without any sweetness or pretentious naming convention. Um, it is, yeah, it's a, it's a six, 6.25% ABV, um, you know, sparkling, you know, carbonated, uh, really surprised how delicate the flavor is. Uh, there's no sweetness at all. Uh, very little, just a, just a little bit of tartness. Uh, I like it. I think it's good. I think that um, maybe just a little bit more raspberry flavor um, would have been uh, just, you know, in a picture, a nice juicy raspberry. Um, I think I, I wanted just a little bit more when I read the bottle. But, um, no, very overall very good and, and would definitely have another one. Yeah. 
Sounds good. Well, uh, OJD's drinking a homegrown uh, uh, brew here tonight. Uh, this is that, uh, it's a coffee porter uh, from Northern Brewer. It was, uh, like I mentioned, uh, you know, a while ago, it was one that was tossed in a freebie uh, when I ordered the two uh, Braggot kits, uh, the bourbon barrel kits. And this, I kind of altered the recipe a little bit. Um, I had read some of the reviews, and it's really, I mean, if you ever go there, or if you're ever looking for, for a kit, uh, check the reviews and uh, check and see what people are talking about. Sometimes you can pick up uh, some pretty good ideas. Uh, a couple that I had found uh, was that uh, one, one, one review said, you know what, uh, don't put the coffee in at the end of the boil like the instructions say. Uh, wait and put it in a carboy. And I thought, okay, I, you know, I, I can do that. Uh, and I changed up the, uh, the beans. I used a dark roast, uh, dark Italian roast. Uh, whole bean. I didn't crush them, didn't do anything to them. Just uh, sanitized them, rinsed them with some spring water, tossed them into the carboy. Uh, and I and I toasted some of those cocoa nibs that I had, about eight ounces, and I dumped those in with the beans. And I just let this porter sit on that for know, a couple of weeks. Threw it in a keg, and lo and behold, uh, man, this stuff turned out uh, really good. I'm, I'm quite proud. Uh, this is the second beer ever uh, that I've done, and uh, my wife absolutely loves it. So I only poured myself a half a glass because if I get caught drinking at all, she's going to be pissed. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll we'll leave it at that. But uh, and uh, you know, if you're interested, it's that Peace Coffee Stout over at Northern Brewer. Pick it up and. Uh, uh, check it out. And that's the only thing different that I did to it. Oh, I did add one pound of lactose to it to uh, uh, help uh, with a little bit of, of sweetness. Uh, and it's just it's just perfect. Everything is just perfect. Got a nice chocolate flavor. Uh, you know, uh, in the in the end, the coffee comes through um, uh, very nice and very smooth. Um should we tell about my little fiasco with the Northern Brewer? Uh, well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, mm. Chris and I had a, had a discussion the other day. We often jump on the phone, and, and uh, you know, one of these days, uh, I guess they're just going to start funneling stock, uh, Verizon stock, into our account. But uh, a couple of hours that uh, we spent on the phone with each other the other day, Chris. <laughs> Chris had Chris had a uh, well. Let's just let Chris explain it. I mean, this this is like the catastrophe of you know. Uh, we all have them once in a while, but this is Chris's. So uh, Chris, yeah. Well, this was one of those uh, totally unexpected things. Uh, I had gotten the Northern Brewer chocolate milk stout kit, and uh, and I bought two of them. Uh, so I put one in and followed the instructions to the letter, uh, got it in secondary. It was ready to keg. So I got out the keg, which I hardly ever use for anything. Haven't used it in a long time. And, um, I had gotten this, uh, really cool gift from this guy, uh, that I know real well. And uh, I wanted to use it. It was a new Blickman beer gun. <clears throat> so um, I thought, well, this will be the perfect time to use this. I'll keg this thing up, and then I'll use my new beer gun to put it in some bottles and send out to all you guys. So uh, I hook everything up. I get the regulator on. I'm going to test it. I rack the beer into the keg. And I turn around to test the regulator, and when I turn on the top valve on the CO2 tank, the entire face of the regulator just blew off. The face, the needle, all the inner workings, everything just <laughs> came out on the floor. And my CO2 is quickly going down. And by the time I realized what had happened, by the time it registered with me, 
it was just sort of one of those moments where you drop your hands and go, well, shit. <laughs> you know, because <laughs> there goes all the CO2. It's gone. And it's on a Sunday, so I can't get anything refilled. And I turn around and I notice this brown liquid on the floor. And somewhere during all this fiasco, my keg has sprung a leak at the weld at the bottom. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so I go into a mad rush, panic, sanitizing, uh, siphoning hose and, and, uh, start trying to rack this thing into a carboy and I get it. I only ended up losing about a pint or so. It was a slow leak. And, um, so you can imagine me with my accent in a hurry and pissed off. I sounded like Boomhauer. (laughs) So, uh, I was, I finally got the thing racked over into a carboy and I just kind of, you know, I just stood back and looked at it for a moment and you just kind of want to go over into the corner and fall through your own ass and just disappear. <laughs> and, uh, oh. So that was, wow. my, little, uh, that was yeah. my little fiasco. He was fit to be tied on the phone, I'm telling you. Uh, so uh, that's... Uh, I like Sco- my, man, i tell you what, man, that big gun kid, man, he just come, come off there, man, and just <laughs> blow it and boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! So, uh, score score one for Chris and one for Ryan. So uh, <laughs> Ryan had that catastrophe with the uh, with the glass carboy, right? Wasn't that Ryan? Yeah. 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 So, Washed uh, the floor three times because every time I walked on it, it was still sticky. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, we're keeping score, right, God? So uh, Chris won, Ryan won. Uh, I haven't had one yet. Uh, I, I think ooh, it's Chris oh. zero, Ryan zero, Carboy one, Blickman one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can, you can put bucket, uh, bucket one, Jeff zero in there too. I, uh, had that fiasco this summer with the, um, oh, what was it? The multiberry, uh, recipe of Chris's that I tried putting together and, oh, uh, that's right. Yeah, no, that's I, right. it, like, Half or uh, yeah, quarter after midnight, that wound up happening, and I ended up spending the next hour moving the washer and the dryer so I could mop up underneath and all that that nasty, you know, half fermented fruit up under it. Yeah, no, I yeah. didn't hear about that. I missed that one. Oh, that that was oh, when was that? May or June, I think. Was that uh, the uh, my my multi berry hydromel? Yeah, yeah, the uh, the the lighter. Oh, okay. APV one. I didn't know you tried to do that. Yeah, yeah, we tried it, and uh, well, it it ended up on the 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 floor of my back room instead of in a bottle or something, so didn't get very far with it. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, Because that's that's a good brew. I I intend to put another one together at some point. I just haven't had the heart to try it again after that mess. We um, Uh, what what happened? Did your airlock get clogged up or something? Or um, I was trying to move the bucket, and it uh, it slipped over the edge of the the fridge that I was keeping it in for for temperature control. Uh, I, I didn't have it completely finished; it just had the had it on the floor of the fridge, um, and that was it, it. I guess with the fluid in there, it was enough to to shake it and push it over the edge. And I I kind of saw it tipping. And went, oh no, there's no way I'm saving this. It hit, and then that the grommet seal uh, busted, and it spilled all over the place. You know, I'll say this. when Whenever you spill a bucket of brew like that, for about three or four hours, it makes your house smell really good. But then the <laughs> next day, it smells like somebody had a drunk and vomited everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. We're, uh, but, we're kind of, we're kind of continuing. You know, last week we, we, uh, and, and this is every, every week. We shut the show down, uh, you know, uh, at the end there. And then uh, we usually sit around a table uh, and hang out and uh, talk about various things. And usually I, I hit the record button and I, re- and I record these post-show discussions. And I'm just piloting them, piling them up. And hopefully I'm going to be able to get to them 
and just cut out some pieces and string them together and uh, just make a whole show out of it. And those are the kinds of uh, things we might play on a Tuesday night when we're off. But um, last week I I didn't – man, we were having such a terrific discussion too, and I I neglected to hit the uh, record button, but – we're kind of we're, we're kind of continuing that discussion, and I, and I think one of the things that we had mentioned, guys, that you know we're thirty. Uh, this is show number thirty-one. Uh, I couldn't believe it until last week when I was when I was putting a show up uh, online, and uh, you know, and I'm typing in episode number thirty, and I'm looking back and I'm thinking, God damn, we've done thirty of these shows. Um, it's been a lot of fun, uh, you know, and I, and I think we've each one of us has gotten something out of it. Uh, I certainly am not a professional brewer, and I've learned quite a bit from Jeff, from Brian, from Chris, uh, you know, from Aaron. Uh, Aaron is responsible for heading me in a new direction. I'll get to that here in a little while, but... Uh, uh, let's pat, let's let's just go around the table. What what have you guys been able to get out of out of this show? Anybody? Well, I'll some, start. some uh, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think probably the biggest thing is just being introduced to different styles that I was completely closed minded to. Um, if you had asked me a year ago, would I ever consider brewing a, a braggot? I would have said, no way, doesn't interest me, don't care about it. Um, if you had asked me a year ago, would I be interested in brewing a a, a light session carbonated mead, I would have said, nope, don't care about it. Um, so not that it's replaced my, my mainstays, but I've, I've been introduced to a lot of new styles, that, and, and not only introduced to them, but willing to try them. Uh, I think that's the biggest thing I've gotten. Yeah. Jeff? Oh, let's see. I think the biggest one for me is, is really like, I don't want to call it a sounding board. I don't, maybe, um, but other, other people that are as interested in, in need as I am and are, are willing to kind of go out there and try new things. And uh, being able to talk to you guys on a really regular basis is, is kind of like, you know, it gives me a, a, somebody to throw my ideas off of. It lets me kind of, you know, I hear what you guys are, are working on and kind of that adds to uh, the stuff that I want to try out. It, it's really the, the, the kind of back and forth in the group has been really fantastic and kind of just helped me um, grow a lot as far as like what I'm interested in and what I'm um, with kind of my, my expertise. Um, I, you know, I, I do feel like just my technique and my, um, I want to say the 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 nutrient regimen and the whole process has been solidified and is just getting really solid now too from from practicing all the time and trying so many different approaches. I mean, the, the also just the the random stuff that we've been trying for fun, like the coffee experiment, has just been a blast. I I probably would have put coffee in something eventually, but it hadn't been a, occurred to me, and it was probably low on my list of stuff to try. But you know, it's it's great fun to try stuff with uh, with other people that are interested in the same things you are. Yeah. What do you think, Aaron? Uh, you know, you're the one that, and we're going to talk about it here in a little bit because uh, I want to get back to uh, Ricky the Mead Maker and the show we had last week. But uh, you've taken me down a new a new path, a new road. Uh, but uh, you know, for your own, uh, you know, what have you gotten out of it? Uh, for yourself you know it's it's hard to just narrow it down to one thing i i think my response will be kind of along the same path as what chris and jeff have said too you know i i think um what what i really get out of this just these discussions that we have is new ideas for new types of recipes whether or not that's a new idea for a new type of ingredient to add or a new method for how to add ingredients. Um, you know, hearing Chris's stories about his, his melomels that start off at, you know, 1160 and uh, just things like that that just, I, I wouldn't have ever guessed doing that. 
Um, you know, the, I think the coffee boche that, that Jeff and I put together is, is another really good example of that, of, you know, something that maybe on, on my own, I wouldn't have, have thought to use those ingredients or, or incorporate those ingredients together in, in that way. So I, I think what, what I'm saying is it's just, uh, when, when you have multiple minds coming together and, and thinking like this, I, I feel like it leads to a lot of creativity and, and new ideas and new concepts for kind of pushing the boundary and, and trying new things before, you know, coming, coming on the show. If, if you look at the majority of the meads I had been making were more, you know, traditionals and, you know, some melomels and braggots and, and things like that. But just some of the, the stuff I've been getting into lately, I think it's, it's pushing the envelope it's going down new creative paths. And, and I think a lot of that is just in part to the discussion and, and ideas that we all have together. Yeah. yeah and Ryan, you know, when you do things as a group, it makes failure easier uh, somehow. Yeah. It does. Uh, Cause you're able it to talk it about it. You're able it to talk it about it. To accept. But yeah, but what's really interesting is that we all try something like the coffee. And we all pretty much failed, uh, if you look at what we were trying to achieve. But yeah. what's interesting is, is we all failed in different ways. <laughs> yeah. And there's, there's a lot to be learned. There's as much to be learned from failure as there is success. Yeah. And I was, I was going to say, Ryan, he's kind of the illegitimate child that comes along after the fact, but <laughs> I'm sorry, guess. Ryan, that just. Yeah. He's like he's like the younger brother that suddenly appears in the family. He's like, where did you come from? R- Ryan came along late in our in our show, and I tell you, he has been uh, one of the most amazing people to have uh, sitting around the table here. I have learned quite a bit from him as well. I like his perspective on things. Uh, Ryan, uh, you know, uh, you haven't been here as, as long as uh, the rest of these guys sitting around the table, but. Uh, uh, you know, what, what's this show all about for you? Well, what I get out of this show is is I get two uninterrupted hours a week to sit and drink in peace. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> yeah. Best answer ever. <laughs> Hell, we might even adopt you now. <laughs> Welcome to the family. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ryan is such a. Kick, I wonder how many I, of our listeners that feel the same way. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I do get once once in a while I'll get some comments about the show and I'll, I'll see a few things on Facebook. I think we're getting uh, we've got a hell of an audience. I know that. I mean, we're uh, we're up way past the two hundred average uh, on a download. So, and those are those are independent. Uh, uh, independent download. So that's, you know, over 200 different people listening to the show. I think that's just fantastic. Um, you know, well, I, I haven't done the, the recent count, but, you know, well, well, well past a thousand downloads. 30, I mean, come on, guys, we're 30 shows into this thing. So, um, you know, it's uh, it's been a fun experience for me. This is the second show uh, that I've been able to produce and I've enjoyed them both. Uh, this one, obviously quite a bit different than the first one. This one suits me more because I get to talk to people who are just like me at different stages in making mead, uh, and, uh, have, have been there, done that kind of thing. I appreciate Chris because he, he, he kind of gives me the uh, under, you know, he he's able to help me understand the chemical side of things. His medical, he's a medical professional, and what he brings to the table in the chemistry end of it has helped me to understand some of the chemistry behind the mead making experience. Uh, you know, and uh, Jeff, uh, you know, with the experiments that he does especially the one where we found uh, Jeff uh, doing the nutrient uh, experiment, uh, I thought was, a, a, you know, an amazing addition to this show uh, because that's something that, uh, you know, we seem to be talking about quite often 
when we get involved in, in making these recipes. And, uh, you know, so I've been able to learn from everybody. Aaron is probably has had the single biggest impact and it didn't come until late uh, in our in our uh, progress here uh, as far as my mead making goes and that has taken me into a whole new direction and of course you know I've talked about it before it's that braggot that he sent uh, and that's the first taste of something that I thought you know what this is what I need to be doing so let's fast forward to last week uh Ricky the mead maker was on our show and what a fun show it was uh you know the guy's a crack up and if you've ever gone out there uh, to his youtube channel and watched his videos i mean it's just some of them are just hilarious uh you see this guy sitting out in the middle of this field at this green pasture uh in a chair with a glass of whatever uh and uh he just starts uh, he just starts talking it's like okay what is this anyway Hilarious stuff, but he's also uh, been very informative uh, about this mead-making process. It was his appearance last week um, that has taken me in a whole new direction uh, with this mead-making because I think I have finally found the mead that I like to drink, okay? And this is that uh, lightly carbonated... Uh, you know, the meads that we were able to uh, to taste from Groenfell Meadery. Uh, I um, sent out an email with kind of kind of a brief breakdown of, of some of the things that I liked from Groenfell. There was a couple I didn't particularly care for. The cherry, I thought, was the best of all. That tart cherry or sour cherry, I guess it was called. Um, that's the kind of mead I want to make right there. Uh, uh, how do you? How did you guys? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm, by now I'm sure you've tasted all of the meads from Groenfell. Did it impact your mead making at all? And if so, anybody, I I will say that I'm definitely eager to try a rookie's approach to things. Um, it, it's going to be a matter of figuring out how to keep a sustained 86 degrees uh, with with what I've got and what I can get my hands on easily here. But man, that uh, you, I, I've been thinking about moving in more of a, a, a lighter ABV, um, more of a, a, a draft style mead for a little while. Um, my the, uh, the what I want to say the saison and the hop mead that I was working on before. We're, we're both kind of nods in that direction, but they didn't quite get where I was was hoping they would be. Um, hopefully, with uh, uh, draft kit or you know, the keg and kit, I should say, uh, coming soon here, I'll have uh, I have the ability to go in that direction a little bit easier uh, as far as the carbonation side goes. But yeah, it, it's definitely something that I'm. Yeah, the whole revelation of like fermenting hot and then uh, using using CO two to get some of that. Uh, just the, the 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 funky stuff out um, after the fact really was a, a weird revelation that I'm I'm still kind of processing myself. Um, but yeah, no, I it, it makes me want to get my hands dirty and try that, you know, in, in my own process. See how that works out. I I went out uh, yesterday and picked up uh, some D forty seven yeast. <laughs> so I'm anxious to get started on a couple as well. Aaron, did you? Uh, uh, any revelations for you? Anything that uh, you're going to try or do differently or experiment with there? Yeah, you know, so it's it's a style of mead that I definitely enjoy. You know, the the lighter ABV session meads, you know, sparkling, um, definitely a, a good way to go. I've tried some other meads that are kind of similar along that style and. I think there's a, at least for my taste, there's definitely a place for that. Um, to me, I, I think of that as being, you know, a hot summer day sitting outside in the sun and, and have something like that it would be just a nice, light, refreshing type of a beverage. Uh, I'm not sure that, you know, for me, it's it's necessarily something that, that I would do regularly. I, I still, 
you know, think back to, to the meads that are more along my, my absolute favorite. And, and I think back to that, that mead I tried from Kurt Stock, the first right. one I ever, ever tried. And it just knocked my socks off, you know, more of a higher ABV, more like a wine style type of, of mead. But, you know, that, that has a place too. And that's, that's not necessarily something that, I would enjoy in that type of a setting of sitting outside on a hot summer day type of a thing. So um, it's definitely this style is something I want to explore a little bit more. Um, I'm actually pretty excited. I think finally this weekend I'm go- going to get around to bottling these three one gallon batches of, of hopped mead that I've got here, um, which is definitely a step in that direction. Um, so I'm, I'm excited to see how those those turn out. But I just have to say, thinking back to last week's episode, I just felt like he was blowing my mind with with some of the the techniques that he uses because it it just seems like like everything is kind of against what what we've learned or or accepted to be the right way or the the proper right. way. But you can't argue with his results. I mean, the the man makes a, a darn fine mead for sure. Yeah. Throw yeah. it over to Ryan. Uh... Well, go ahead, Jeff. If you had something to add. Oh no, I was just agreeing with, uh, with what uh, Aaron was saying there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when I first started drinking meads, uh, you know, there's beers that I could drink every day. There's wines that I could drink every day, but I hadn't found uh, many meads that I drink every day. They were mostly occasion meads or occasional meads, something that you might not even necessarily want every day. And so uh, the style of mead that I started making on a regular basis was this, you know, session strength, you know, bottle, I don't, I I was doing mostly bottle carbonating and I still do, but, you know, the session strength, uh, you know, carbonated mead. Um, And you know, Ricky, I, I I think I've told you guys, you know, a couple times now how just blown away I was with with Valkyrie's choice, the um, the traditional, yeah. because that is that is hard to do. It is very difficult to make a, a traditional mead, a good traditional mead, you know, number one, and it only gets harder if you want to. And it only gets harder after that if you want to do a low alcohol one. Um, so I, yeah, for me, it, it's kind of like, Hey, this is, it's the style that I prefer because it's something that you can, you know, drink regularly. Um, and, uh, and it made me, you know, say, yes, you, you can achieve this kind of level of, of flavor and complexity. Um, you know, within that, that category. Yeah. I found that Valkyrie's choice, uh, was probably number two underneath that cherry, uh, thing for me as well. I just, I, I thought it was amazing how the, that wildflower honey aroma came out and just the whole flavor. It made me think now this is, this is the whole perception thing that, that is really kind of funky. Uh, because when you when you get a good nose on that Valkyrie choice, and then you go to take a sip, it makes you think you're drinking something sweet, and uh, you know, but it wasn't sweet. Uh, it, it had a very nice flavor, very mild. I, I dig the uh, the wildflower aroma. God, I just keep my nose in the glass all the time. It just smelled good. It tasted good. It was refreshing. Uh, and uh, love the character. Chris, uh, you and I had talked on Sunday, and we were kind of uh, discussing this whole... Uh, uh, oops, did we lose Ryan again? Uh, we were talking about um, the uh, uh, the fact that, you know, he's using D47. I mean, it's a, pretty much a, a workhorse, uh, you know, uh, type of a yeast. But then this 86 degree thing, um, mm-hmm. you know, what, what did you get out of uh, last week's show? 
Well, you know, I think my words to you were, I'll believe it when I see it, therefore I'm going to try it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so um, I, I believe some of my ancestors must have come from Missouri because I'm sort of a show me kind of guy. Um, <laughs> No, no, no! All you people listening from Missouri. <laughs> yeah. Did I mention I was born well, and raised in Missouri? <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? You know what I'm talking oh, oh, about, Ben. Yeah. You and I have the same instinct, Chris. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, you know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, but look, here's here's the thing. Uh, this whole conversation for me is sort of a on one hand, but on the other hand kind of thing um i'm i'm a wine guy i'm not a beer guy and uh therefore my style of mead is is more wine like i'm more of a ken shram kurt stock michael fairbrother sergio Matella uh style of mead maker uh on the other hand my wife absolutely loved everything from grunfeld and so did i uh it was a whole different style uh, and um, and therefore she demands that I make that style, so I'm going to. Oh, yes, um, I'm going to. <laughs> yeah. Happy wife, happy I mean, life. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> if, if Mama ain't happy, nobody is. And, that's why. Uh, I, that's why I'm going to keep perpetually making this chocolate coffee stout thing. <laughs> my so God, we're all on the same page, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, the first rule of being a man is that you're going to spend your life doing things you don't want to do. Yeah. So, <laughs> uh, I learned that early on. Um, so, so uh, he, you know, I like the style. I like everything that he sent. My favorite of all of them was the ginger, uh, the root of all evil. That was that was my by far my favorite one. And that's what I'm going to make. Uh, it was my wife's favorite also. Um, on on one hand, it's difficult to make a good mead anyway, regardless of what style. Yeah. Uh, it's even harder to make a dry one, just like Ryan said. It's harder to make a session and still retain any kind of honey character. So... Uh, you got to hand it to him. He's he's pulling off some some amazing feats to be able to do it on a regular basis, uh, to be able to do it in three weeks. And, um, you know, when when I see that kind of thing happening, I have to give it a try. Uh, yeah. Comes back to what I said when you asked what we got out of the show. I've been introduced to a lot of different styles and willing to try new styles that I never would have tried before. Um, what is my staple? My staple is always going to be more wine like because in my heart, that's what I like best. Uh, but I mean, there was absolutely nothing wrong with anything he sent. They were all good. Yeah. But you know, the, the beautiful thing about having a staple, but trying new things is that it just expands your horizons a little bit and gets you, you, it gives you some perspective to help you reapproach the things that you're really interested in, like your staples and uh, see them with a fresh perspective too, I think. So the, that is another nice part about the show is that we're all kind of, we're all stretching very subtly out of our comfort zone and um, just finding, finding new approaches to things. Well, absolutely. It took, it, you know, it took me to a, to a whole new, uh, to a whole new level here, where, or at least a whole new perspective, I should say, um, with my mead making, because I have been searching, okay? I mean, I, and I've had a lot of mead uh, over the course of the last few years. Uh, a lot of it sent to me uh, as, you know, tastings, uh, you know, from the two shows that I've done, some of it that I've made here at the house, some of it that I bought, uh and having never been satisfied, um, uh, not you know, and, and and this is not a knock on the stuff that I've tasted. They're all perfectly good meat, uh, just not quite my 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 liking. 
um, maybe I've got a peculiar, you know, flavor, taste profile or whatever in the things that I like. I mean, typically I don't like sweet things. A lot of the meads that I've had have been very sweet. And they're the type of things where, you know, you take a couple of sips out of the glass, put the glass down, and you're pretty much done. I, I didn't want that. I wanted something that wanted... I wanted something that when I put the glass down, something that was going to make me pick it back up again and, and take a couple of more sips. And that's how I felt Just, about yeah. this Groenfell stuff. That's how I felt about Aaron's, uh, uh, that Braggot. Um, I think you just described my mead perfectly. Yeah. That's, that's exactly what I make. It's a, it's a one glass and you're done. Uh, you don't want any more. It's, right. it's heavy. It's it's a mouthful to drink. It's uh, relatively sweet, but still balanced. Um, yeah. But it's a you know that's what I make. I make the kind of thing where you finish a meal, uh, you get some dessert, you get a nice piece of hot, warm, moist chocolate cake, and one glass of my mead, and that's pretty much it. Yeah. Um, yeah. therefore I bottle in 375. <laughs> uh, so that's, that's the style of meat I make, but that's just, that doesn't mean anyone's right or wrong. That's strictly a difference in, in personal taste and preference. Yeah. Well, I, uh, you know, I blasted out an email the other day after, sitting here thinking about it and I kind of, you know, looking back at the show last week and I kind of ran through the, the different ones that he had sent and the cherry, again, is probably my, my, my most favorite. It's just amazing how he's able to get, I mean, it's, it, it felt like you were eating cherries right out of the can. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it wasn't sweet. It wasn't, uh, it was just perfect. Everything about it was just perfect. And that's uh, that's the kind of mead that I want to make. So, Jeff, I, I really apologize. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure you saw it in my email, but I went through and I tossed everything I had, uh, basically, in one gallon. All my I had a I had a number of one gallon deals going. I chucked them all uh, because I, I knew that they they weren't even going to be anywhere close to what I now want to do. This is the mead that I want to make. Um, and so, I mean, I, I, it's almost like I'm, I'm starting over again. Okay, I've, I've got this new road to go down. Uh, I'm very eager. I've got four packs of D47. I'm going to start four different meads eventually. Uh, I'd like to try that cherry thing, and I'd like to try, you know, uh, something else, you know, um, you know, a couple of different mellow mellows and a traditional, and uh, see what it takes to get to the level uh, of the meads that I had uh, from growing So, um, uh, JD, before we get into uh to any other subject, uh, while we're on the mentioning experimentation, uh, I want to ask Ryan a question. Uh, this was actually something that, that he mentioned back right before he joined the show, and we never did expound on it at all. Um, and it was in the middle of our coffee experiment or right afterwards. Ryan mentioned something about the way to get the coffee flavor we were looking for was to not use coffee, but to actually use uh, a black malt or, or a chocolate malt or something. Ryan, tell us, tell us about that. We never, we never had a chance to talk about that on the show. Yeah. So it's, it's still, um, it's, it's in the bottle. I, I haven't, uh, sampled it in quite some time um if you give me a moment here i can tell you exactly what i used um it was uh simpson's coffee malt as i believe what i was using at the time um which you know i got from northern brewer and it 
it just gives you the, and I cold steeped it, and it just gives you the aroma of, um, you know, just, just a great cup of coffee. Um, and, you know, it's, it's what brewers often use if they're trying to stay pure with, you know, the malt and, and, uh, hops. Um, uh, if they're creating, you know, that, uh, that coffee, uh, their coffee stouts or porters or, or what have you. Um, and it's, it just has to do with the way that, that the, uh, roasters, I don't know if that's what they're called, but the guys roasting, uh, are roasting the malts. Um, and it's, it's really funny. Barley, barley is a very funny ingredient in that, um, the way you treat it, you can bring out coffee notes, you can bring out chocolate notes, you can bring out caramel notes or honey notes or or even kind of fruity notes. Um, it's a really it's a, it's a unique little little uh, specimen there. Um, but yeah, you know, in listening to to a lot of the problems that that people have had when they try to add adjuncts and create coffee beers or cordials or, or meads for that matter. Um, you know, I said, well, I've never heard of anybody complaining that their coffee stout didn't turn out when they were using coffee malt, you know? And so that, that's where it, it kind of started. Um, Chris, I owe you, uh, I owe you a, uh, a tasting notes and, and I got some Christmas parties coming up and we'll crack open a few bottles and I'll pass them around. But I'll tell you, it, yeah. it tasted, uh, it smelled great. And, um, and then if you recall, I added hops to mine as well. So, so I, I'm looking for a little bit of a, a hoppy, uh, coffee you know, flavor coming, uh, out of this thing. Now, did you, uh, I think you mentioned something about you steep this, this for a long time, like a week or two. That it, it was the, just an overnight. That was the, uh, honey malt. Um, I, I steeped the coffee malt for 24 hours. I think it was 24, 24, maybe 48 hours, but it was almost certainly 24. Um, and that that gave me all the color and and the aroma and it was it, I when I I have a jar I've got almost a two gallon jar that um, has an airtight lid on it. Um, I actually got it from Northern Brewer as part of a kit. And when I opened it up, it just it, it's like you were drinking a or, or opening up a cold a cold brewed coffee. Um, the honey malt, um, I did for, I cold steeped for seven days. Um, well, we're still calling that one a happy accident. <laughs> okay. hey, that's, hey, that, that's kind of how, that's the discovery process. I mean, that's how you find out something and, new, right? And you did that just to get extra honey flavor. Is that right? Yeah, the goal with that one was I wanted to make a a relatively quick um you know about a one month mead and I wanted it to be session strength but I wanted the I wanted to see if I could get some honey flavor out of the malt. Um you, you know the uh, again, you know when I when I ferment completely dry, you know I you lose a lot of the honey flavor. And when you let it age, it returns, of course. So what I was trying to say was, can I ferment it dry, but still retain a little bit of honey flavor? Now, I said this before I'd ever heard of Ricky's, you know, three week process. <laughs> um, but, uh, but I'll, I would say that, that my process of, uh, or what I was trying to do with, with using this, this honey malt, Canadian honey malt, um, it, it definitely gives it a little more complexity. I would say that it's not, it's not perfected by any means. I mean, what, what's perfected after one batch, but, uh, it, it does give you this, this really interesting complexity. Um, it, it's got a little bit of 
of maltiness. However, with that being said, um, you know, the vast majority of it was unfermentable sugars that were, you know, that were coming from it. So it's definitely interesting. And, and like Jeff always says, um, this is, you know, meat is something that we're constantly learning about or constantly, uh, you know, rev- um, learning new ways to make it new processes and, and, and what can be done. I mean, if you, if you're making a beer, if you're making a wine, there's a formula. Now you can create different recipes within that formula, but, but that's kind of how you make beer. It's kind of how you make wine. And with me, it's, it's still the, uh, it, it's like an Italian airport. There are no rules. There are no, yeah. I've been there, done that. <laughs> there are no mm-hmm. rules. Um, interesting. Well, I, I'm really interested in, in pursuing that coffee malt because, uh, I, I don't tend to give up on something that easily. And, and I tried, uh, I tried two versions of the coffee mead. Uh, the first, you know, JD and I did the same thing. That was a total flop that went down the drain. The yeah. second one I did, uh, just by brewing coffee. I mean, I brewed coffee just like I would drink and I used it to make mead. It was much better. Still not what I was looking for. So I, I just don't like to give up on something that easily. And um, so I, I'm really interested in, in giving that a try. Um, the only other thing that I can think of that I may want to try is to do the same thing that J.D. and I did, only this time just go all out. Just use the entire volume of water uh, made into full-strength coffee. and Maybe yeah. that'll get us where we're going. I think the, inter- the we I, think, I think the Chris, I think the interesting part of that whole thing is I sit here thinking about um my wife loves these coffee stouts and coffee porters. Uh and, and, and she'll pretty much I mean she's got her favorite brands out there. Um and and, and I mean including this one that I made for her. And it's interesting how the coffee really comes out nicely in in the beer, uh, but we just can't put it together quite yet in the mead. And I don't know. Well, I mean, this this may be this may be uh, part of that answer. This this uh, what Ryan's talking about. This coffee malt. So yeah, and let's not forget what Patty Mackey suggested, which was yeah. to just do our steep in secondary. Uh, which is basically what you did with that that coffee stout. Yeah, and it's uh, not you know that that didn't come out. Um, uh, well, yeah, the coffee stout, yeah. Uh, but I, I did do a mead that way too, uh, which is I've got two gallons of it that I saved, uh, and uh, I get it bottled up, and I'll get it out to you guys. Uh, that's the only one that I saved. I, I, I did several coffee things, but I'm more interested in this coffee malt. Uh, and, uh, I mean, that's, uh, I, you know, I, I can see Chris's wheels turning already. Uh, I think it's going to go on my list of experiments, too. Uh, yeah, I, I can't shot. let this thing go because if you guys had any idea how much coffee I drink in one day, uh, I probably drink more coffee in one day than you guys drink in a week. Yeah. Uh, he's he's part owner of Starbucks. <laughs> I, uh, well, I, I, I might have to challenge you on that. I would never. I might have to challenge you. I would never too. own. <laughs> I would we got never some own coffee stock in here. Starbucks. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> for personal reasons, but yeah. Uh, but anyway, uh, that aside, uh, I drink a lot of coffee, and I just I can't imagine not making a good coffee mead. That's just something that I've got to do. Yeah. And uh, matter of fact, I'm about to go make a K cup right now. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, the the honey brown ale is gone. Well, I still, I mean, I still, uh, you know, there's there's one other coffee experiment out there that I want to try, 
And it's only because I love Kahlua. Uh, and I make I even make my own homemade Kahlua. And this, again, goes back to Patty Mackey. Uh, she made a batch of coffee mead. She says tastes better than any Kahlua that she's ever had. And she made a traditional sweet mead and then uh, cold steeped, basically, the beans in the mead. And, uh, you know, it came out with a, apparently a nice, uh, robust flavor that you would typically find in a, in a Kahlua, that real rich, deep, roasty coffee flavor uh, that you get out of a Kahlua. So that's one that I still have yet to try yet. And uh, uh, so I, I haven't completely over, you know, I haven't, I haven't completely uh, thrown the whole coffee idea out, out the window yet either. But uh, uh, I do like this idea with the, uh, the, uh, the uh, coffee malt. Um, moving into another category, here a while back, guys, we all started these Braggit experiments. I want to quickly go around the table and uh, find out where we're at with them. I, I think uh, uh, let's go with um, throw it over to Jeff. I think Jeff's already in the bottle, right? Didn't you already bottle yours up already? Oh, yeah, it's already bottled. Uh, I tried bottle carbonating it, and the carbonation phase did not take. Um, that was sad, but, you know, this is – it is still one of the tastiest damn uh, – damn meads that I've made uh, ever, I think. So, uh, well, let's talk, talk talk about the carbonating. Uh, I don't, I, don't uh, I remember you talking about it before, but I don't know if we fully explored it. Why, why sure. do you think it didn't carbonate? Well, there, there are a lot of possibilities here. It could have been the alcohol content that was kind of throwing that off. It could have been, and I imagine uh, a big part of it was the fact that I was trying to carbonate it with the yeast that was already um in solution in a, a beer that was pretty much, or, sorry, a, a braggot that was pretty much settled. Uh, so I'm not sure there was a lot of viable yeast to start with in solution to, to really get a carbonation going. Um, it probably would have been better if I pitched a little bit of uh, fresh yeast in with my, my priming sugar. Um, that that might have given me, uh, given me a little bit more uh, result, what I was looking for, as opposed to just, you know, the, uh, leaving whatever was left in a, a pretty clear um, uh, the product. Um, We're so careful to not pick up some of that sludge at the bottom of the carboy when we rack or bottle, right? So, uh, well, and I'll, I'll also say this: this surprised me as well. The the saison yeast that I used, I actually had. Um, and this was one of my, my notes that I was kind of elated about when I racked it for the first time. I had a, a really minimal loss of space to the yeast cake. I mean, it compacted really nicely. Um, I lost very little volume. I still had, I think I started with um, around six and a half gallons of, of starter must. And I had um, well over six gallons when I racked to, to secondary. I mean, I, I had a, a little extra container that... Um, I just kind of poured out into a, a thing and enjoyed still um, because it it tasted really good even moving to secondary. Um, so it, um, the the yeast was very efficient and didn't eat up a lot of space in the the fermenter either, for that matter. Yeah. Um, so I I think if maybe if I had for one used something other than the the beer yeast that I was using as the uh, the carbonating yeast, maybe just threw in some uh, EC1118 or something like that, along with the priming sugar, I, I would have achieved a better result. Um, it, it may have been the fact that I, for whatever reason, I wasn't expecting the yeast to be as efficient as it was. Uh, I had a target alcohol by volume of 9% on this one, and it came out like very nearly 11%. Um, just because it, it dried out the yeast, I, I'm sorry, it dried out the, the honey I expected it to, and then took it well past uh, um, yeah. the one. I think the, the final gravity was something like 998, 996, ridiculously low. So, I don't know. Um, I, I also think if I try this again, I'm just going to try force carbonating instead and see where that goes. Yeah. 
my two uh, my two projects. Now, uh, you know, keep in mind, I did two of the bourbon barrel uh, beer kits, uh, bourbon barrel porters from Northern Brewer. One I added uh, honey to. The other I took two pounds of dry malt extract out, substituted that for two pounds of honey. Um, they're both still on carboy because they're both, they both have oak, uh, in them. And that obviously needs time to uh, mature, uh, probably a couple more weeks at best. I was going to rack one of them today into a, into a keg. Uh, I tasted it, not quite what I'm expecting yet. Um, and I think maybe a little bit of time is going to help on that. So, uh, they both taste okay. Uh, I, I'm not jumping up and down yet about them, but I mean they're they're kind of headed in the in the direction that I expected them to go, uh, which is kind of a plus if you you know if you're me. So uh, so I'm I'm pleased with the, with the progress uh, that they're making, um, and I'm actually kind of eager to start another. Uh, uh, something maybe uh, on the lighter side, uh, using some lighter, uh, some lighter extracts, uh, you know, some lighter grain, uh, that kind of thing. Um, maybe even some lighter honey, like a orange blossom or or a clover. I mean, you know, of course, uh, we're kind of limited on the types of clover we can get out here, but um, it's clover that we get here in California is still. Uh, quite a bit lighter than a wildflower that we might get. So, um, J- or, uh, Ryan, uh, did you have a braggot going as well? Yeah. Where are you at with it? Um, Mele Kaliki Maka, Me- <laughs> which um, is, of course, Hawaiian for Merry Christmas because it was a uh, a stout um with uh g- coconut and and um caramelized right. honey um <clears throat> you know and and the thing with mine it's it's not quite where i want it to be either um and uh, the main thing that i i think of is that i've i've had a few uh, Bouchers in my, um, mead sampling career. And they typically take a while to come around. I mean, I've heard people say, you know, you, some of the best ones are five years old. Um, yeah, I'm not going to wait that long. I don't think it's going to take that long, but I think that this one, it does need a little bit of time to let that, that caramelized honey, um work it's it's the the only honey i used was caramelized honey i didn't do a mix of you know some caramelized some uncaramelized uh that kind of thing um you know so, so maybe next christmas i mean it's i don't maybe it won't even take that long but i think it needs a little while yet um this is of course before i known had i known that i could have uh i can get a meat in in you know 12 hours if i ferment it at 115 degrees like uh ricky suggests <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah there you go um aaron did you uh what do you got yeah so i had at this point have just put together the recipe for mine it's a uh, black ipa style um still just some some things going on here that are preventing me from from making a bunch of mead and, and beer and stuff at this point, but um, I, that's definitely at the top of my list when when I get back to it. Yeah, cool. And uh, Chris, uh, what's going on with uh, your? Well, you know, I've I've got the uh, Irish Red Ale, right? Uh, Braggot, and uh, this was an idea from from Ken Schram. And uh, I, I like Ken's meads, and uh, though you know, if you've been listening for very long, you know I replicated or tried to replicate his Heart of Darkness, and 
So uh, someone along the line said we should call it the heart murmur. So uh, <clears throat> then when this braggart came along uh, and I decided to do it again, I did it several years ago. And uh, so when I decided to do it this time, I, I said, you know, I, I need to talk to Ken about this and sort of ask him where, where was he going with this? What was he trying to achieve? So, so I talked to Ken uh, a while back about it, and, uh, and he gave me some pointers on, on how it was, uh, you know, why the IBUs were so high on it. Uh, the IBUs on it are, are like 65, so it's, uh, it's, it's almost along the lines of a double IPA. Um, um, but it's got a, a, an Irish red ale at its base. And so I asked him, I said, well, what's this thing come out like? What's the final verdict on it and he said i'm not going to tell you he said i'm going to let you wait and taste it yourself and i said oh come on tell me tell me how it turned out he goes not going to say a word about it you you figure it out (laughs) and you let me know what you think so since he wouldn't tell me anything he was completely silent on the subject i decided to call it silence of the shram (laughs) you got you got to send him a bottle (laughs) yeah Uh, that's good so so from now on it's going to be the silence of the shram brag it and um yeah and uh so uh it's uh it's in secondary now and it's got a ways to go it's gonna have to settle down quite a bit, which is something we talked about in the beginning of this project that um, the few braggots that I have made, which is only two other than this one, uh, have required quite a bit more aging than anything else I've made. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's going to be sitting a while. Uh, it's still extremely bitter and uh, not smooth at all. So uh, I mean, I can I can see that it's there. It's just going to have to calm down a little. Of course, it's going to be bitter forever with sixty five IBUs. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. But it's uh, uh, that it, it's going to balance with the sweetness once once some of the sweetness starts to come back in it. Yeah. Um, I want to wrap the show uh, tonight, guys. Chris and I uh, have have ventured off onto another project. Uh, and I know we've talked about it uh, on a couple of shows. And this is that graph. This is that uh, apple cider, apple juice, and beer where you steep some grains, you add some hops, you go through the whole boil process, uh, and then you uh, chuck all that into a, into a hopper full of uh, apple juice. Uh, and so Chris and I have uh, pretty much done an identical uh, recipe. Uh, it's the uh, Brandon O's that's found on the Home Brew Talk. Uh, we've included it on our website. Uh, it's called Graph. Uh, and um, I, I just kind of wanted to now. This just I started mine. I believe it was on the 30th of November, uh, and uh, so it, it's been going. Uh, I think Chris is Chris started his a little little before me. But uh, I'm eager. Uh, I'm, I'm eager to really try this stuff. Uh, interesting, uh, interesting recipe. Everything that I've read about it from all, you know, there's over 300, 350 some odd pages of uh, related to this graph on homebrewtalk.com, and I'm about almost through all, you know, all of the pages. I'm on like, you know, 148 now. Um, and w- the ones that talk about that are related specifically to the original recipe have all said that it, it, it tastes amazing. Uh, and uh, today, Chris, I, I checked my gravity today. Um, I was getting a little bit concerned because uh, I started this thing uh, on the 30th. I didn't get any activity until the 1st. Uh, we started out at 1064, if you recall. And um, on the 4th, it was still at 1040. And I thought, well, 
Usually Nottingham is a little better performer than that. Usually Nottingham will come right through. Uh, but today I checked, and we're making progress because it's all the way down at about 118 now, uh, 018. So uh, mm-hmm. I'm going to give it another probably another three, four days, see if it bottoms out. And then uh, put it in a car, boy. Is that what you did? Yeah, I, I went through. Um, uh, I think mine ended up at ten twelve, um, and then I went straight from uh, from primary into the bottle. Mm, okay. Um, I, I just racked it into a bottling bucket with my priming sugar and, and bottled it. I will say this though: I've got. I've got one batch in bottles. I've got one batch in secondary, and I've got a third batch that's about to go in as soon as my uh, get a bucket open. Um, <laughs> and and I'm going to say this: there's two things you need to know if you decide to make this. First of all, uh, the the results change almost daily. Once you get this thing in out of primary. The taste changes drastically every time you taste it. So time is extremely important with this. Uh, It's going to take uh, three or four or five weeks for this thing to finally get to a point where you can make a final judgment on it. The second, and I think this is the most important thing you need to know, the results of this are going to depend entirely on your expectations. Um, some people make this and they're, they're beer brewers and they're expecting a, uh, an apple ale yeah. beer. Some people make it and they're expecting a cider. Uh, so your expectations uh, and what you consider a good cider is everything with this recipe. And don't underestimate the difference between the uh, Crystal 60 and the Crystal 120. There's a huge difference there. Don't underestimate uh, the importance of a little tannin in there, which is why I added four black tea bags on the second batch. And don't underestimate the importance of the added ascorbic acid in the apple juice that you purchase at the store, all of these things come into play and they, they make drastic differences. So, um, yeah, consider what you think is a good cider. What do you want? First of all, you're not making a beer, you're making a cider. This is in and of itself in every way, a cider, not a beer. The beer components the, yeah, the beer components, the grain that that's included, and the hops, those are meant to augment the young nature of a cider. So you are making a cider. Um, but decide what kind of cider you like, and then let that decision guide you uh, as, to, as to the ingredients you choose. If you like a dry, crisp, um, slightly acidic cider, Go with the Crystal 60 and don't be afraid of the apple juice that has ascorbic acid added. Uh, Also, consider adding in some black tea bags in the steep. If you like a sweeter cider, go with the 120L Crystal Malt and maybe consider finding some apple juice that doesn't have the ascorbic acid. Those things seem trivial but they make a huge difference in the final product i went with the uh with the 120 i i ordered the 120 l uh thinking that i you know i mean virtually every freaking thing of apple juice i've seen on the shelves and in the stores that i shop at every single one of them have uh you know vitamin c ascorbic acid in them so I, you know, I thought, okay, I'm, I'm not even going to fool with it. I'm just going to get the 120. Well, lo and behold, um, I managed to find the exact same apple juice that Chris is using. <laughs> so, uh, 
so yeah, so mine is going to have that sweeter component to it because it's pure, unadulterated, you know, apple juice. I have no idea what the apples are that are in it, but uh, I took a sip of the juice itself before I, you know, when I was dumping it into the into the uh, fermenter, and it's good stuff. I like it. So, mm-hmm. uh, uh, you know, so yeah, I. The the one twenty from from what I've tasted so far tends to give sort of a caramel note uh, to the cider. Uh, which might which, which might to, be okay. That that actually might yeah. taste pretty good. I mean, caramel and apples go together anyway, right? Oh yeah, it's absolutely. Uh, I mean, the the taste is absolutely great. It's not that. It's not what I was shooting for because you know that you and I both we like the Magners, which is Oh, which God, is a God. fairly dry, very crisp, dry. Whereas this, with the caramel and the little bit of sweetness, is a little more, uh, I don't know, a little warmer flavor, yeah. I guess you might say. It's its more the kind of thing that you might imagine sitting by the fireplace and drinking. Um, whereas a drier, crisper cider would be something like a summertime drink. So neither one of them are bad in any way. They're just different. And yeah. you can use, you can choose your ingredients there um, to suit your taste in cider if you like cider. Yeah. And I put the link uh, in the recipe, uh, in, in, in the post that I put on the webpage, I did put the link to the homebrewtalk.com page. Uh, that highlights Brandon O's, uh, and we made every attempt to contact Brandon O uh, with with no uh, result. I just uh, I gave up after a couple of days, but did uh, credit the recipe to his name. Um, there, if you go to that link and, and read, and like I said, there's 300 and some odd pages related to this one recipe. Um, don't be fooled by 98 percent or even 99 percent of the comments made in there because this kind of goes back to uh chris's soapbox uh the day he stood up and 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 offered up a sermon um because people make comments in there about i did the exact (laughs) same recipe but you know I, i changed this i changed that uh whatever but there is enough comments in there if you read if you're able to kind of weed out, uh, you know, the, the, the mishmash. Uh, there is a, enough comment in there to at least tell you where you should wind up with your, with your ABV, with your gravity. Uh, that was of interest to me. I kind of wanted to know that. I kind of wanted to know what people thought uh, about it. Um, there's some mixed reactions from different people, and Chris is right on the money when he talks about, uh, you know, there are beer brewers and there are cider makers that are brewing this up. And if you're a beer brewer and you approach this thing as if it was a beer because you go through this whole boil, you know, steep the grain, boil, add the hops uh, thing, and pour it in the fermenter, you, you might you might be... Uh, uh, you know, you you might be surprised. You you might not You'll be disappointed. <laughs> yeah, uh, because this is not a beer. Uh, this is definitely a cider. And Chris, I got that from uh, you know the majority of what I'll call legitimate reactions that people had uh, in the forum. Mm-hmm. In that forum, that's what I got from from most of them. That it was you know a damn good cider, an unusual but good cider. So. Uh, mm-hmm. Aaron and, yep. and Ryan, uh, Jeff, uh, I, I would encourage you guys to jump on this and give it a shot. I have been thinking about it, and Chris, I do appreciate the uh, the the input there on the sixty versus the one twenty, and using the scorpic acid or not. I think uh, I think that's going to help me kind of make some some directions on the way I want to go with it. Here, here's here's mm-hmm. the uh, now, Chris. You're going to have to help me out with the name, old old friend. I, I, I can't remember the name of the damn apple juice. Um, oh, it was a. It's simply apple. Simply apple. Okay, and this is yeah, a. You, another you the Walmart. 
Yeah, there's yeah, a Wal- it, can, Walmart. Uh, it's a Walmart brand. It's a national brand. Okay, and you should yeah, be able but to you find, will it not find it on the shelf. You won't find it on the shelf. It'll be in the cooler section in the back. Uh, where the uh, or- where the uh, cold orange juice is kept, uh, and it, they have simply orange and simply apple and simply uh, they, they got several different juices. But yeah. those uh, the ones that are simply apple are all those that line of juices. They have nothing added whatsoever. No no ascorbic acid. No nothing. Um, which Depend, like I said, depending on what you want, may be a good thing or it may not. Um, I'm I'm pretty much under the impression that if you're using the 120L, you probably need the ascorbic acid um, to help balance it out, you know, a little bit. But if you're after a really heavy, sweet, uh, caramelly something. Uh, you might want to use the 120L and and skip the ascorbic acid. So, like I said, you're going to have to tailor it to to what you're after. To me, this first one that I made with the 120L and no ascorbic acid, um, to me, it just screams to be warmed up with a little cinnamon stick. That's what it reminds me of. Uh, yeah. Whereas what I'm really after is something a little lighter and more crisp. So, yeah. um, I think what I'm going to end up going after is using 60 L. Uh, I'm going to use the simply apple with no ascorbic acid and the four black tea bags included in the steep with the grains. And I, and I think that's pretty much going to do it for me. That's, that's really all it needs. Yeah. That's that's what I did. Uh, talking to Chris on Sunday uh, before I had started uh, started my batch, I uh, uh, I uh, had uh, made the decision to go ahead and take his advice. So uh, my recipe is like his second recipe. Other than that, everything is exactly the same. So uh, and again, and that's I simply think. Uh, a- Go ahead. The, the the batch you have the batch you have in there, JD. Uh, I think you're going to find the only thing that you're going to want to change is you're going to want to step down to the 60 L yeah. crystal. Well, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I wasn't counting on being able to find an apple juice uh, without ascorbic acid in it uh, at a reasonable price. I mean. Uh, there is an organic, uh, all natural, pure apple juice that I could get at like a Whole Foods market, but it's like eight bucks a gallon, and I just didn't feel like, you know, uh, this is first time out. Uh, really didn't want to spend that kind of money on something that might not work out, but I did manage to find. Now, I, I, I did also find the Simply Apple at our local grocery store the other day when we went grocery shopping. Uh, and they had a whole shelf full of it uh, in the cooler uh, with all the juices. So uh, it is a Walmart uh, nationwide brand. I did ask the guy there at the Walmart that, that I got ours from. Uh, so if you've got a Walmart in your town, guys, they should carry it in the uh, refrigerated section. So uh, well, other than know, that. I've got roughly, roughly 35 bucks in a five-gallon bag. That's grains and everything. Yeah. Um, you that's that's about as cheap of a five gallon. You know the, the kind of stuff you can just slam glass after glass. Yeah, uh, that's, that's what I like. You just can't beat that. <laughs> you can't beat that <laughs> hardly at all. That is a fantastic so price. Actually. You know, yeah. uh, I, I I hear time and time again. Oh yeah, I got into homebrew and trying to save money, and it hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's mm-hmm. probably not going to happen. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, all right, guys. Well, hey, the music has started. Uh, that means we need to bring this thing to a close. Uh, another outstanding discussion here on a Tuesday night. Uh, what do you say we all come back next Tuesday night? We'll do it again. I think we've got a few more shows before we call it quits for the holidays. 
Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll see if we can't get some kind of a calendar out there for folks to uh, stare at uh, along the way. But uh, cool show. Again, thanks to Ricky the Mead Maker last week. All the mead that he sent out to everybody. Uh, I guess with that, we'll see everybody next week. 9 o'clock right here at the Mead House. TheMeadHouse.com. 